Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. This is Michael Waits, Asia Tech Podcast Stories, and I'm with Tiang Lim Fu. Seed Stars, right? Did I get that C right? Seed Plus. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> Seed Plus. Seed Plus, excuse me. No, but I think, right. you, I think you probably get that often, though, no? No, no, no. This is the first time, i got to say. Yes. Oh, come on. And it's we funny because I'm, read, yeah. I'm, I'm reading, actually, C+. Plus. Maybe my eyes are just bad. I'm reading right C off of your plus. summary on LinkedIn. C+. Yeah, plus. yeah, yeah. But let's go, back, let's, go, let's go back to the headphones, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. So the, sure, the yeah. AirPods, right? Yep, AirPods. You said with similar, like, functionality, right? But does, is it really similar? No, so like I think that's that, that's what makes it great, right? Because you know, and that's where this is where Apple does its job best. It's fully integrated in the, in the ecosystem. The moment you you pop it open, it's paired. You do not need to fumble around with uh, you know Bluetooth connectivity and settings. Uh, the audio quality, well, you can find the like, true be told, you can find. Um, um, Bluetooth earbuds with better audio quality. Earbuds, but this isn't. Yeah, yeah, but this isn't bad at all, right? In fact, it's actually pretty good. No, and if you didn't tell me, frankly, that you run yeah. wireless Bluetooth ear earphones, I never would have known. That's why I asked you, right? I just wasn't sure. Right. But I like to make sure for recording purposes that yeah, we've had people record with us and. <laughs> They're not on headphones at all, and just the background noise can sometimes get to be bad. terrible, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Plus, with the added benefit that, you no, know, I'm making a fashion statement right now. No, so. for sure. <laughs> well, the added benefit of no wires, right? I mean, this is the whole thing. No if, wires at all. If yeah. you exercise at all, having a wireless setup is just, it's like nirvana for me, at least. True, true, absolutely. Yeah, so do you want to give a little bit of background yourself now that we spent five minutes talking about Apple computer or Apple products? <laughs> Straight, wait, hang on. What, have we started recording or? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. just want to put on my live voice right now. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background. So you, you recently had Michael, my partner from C+. Michael Smith, uh, yep. On the show. I heard that. It was a great conversation, by the way. I Thank you very much. I thought, he was, I thought he was incredible. Yeah, it was a great conversation, I have to say, and I uh, can't wait for part two. So, hat tip and kudos to Michael. Great. Yeah. And um, so, I'll, I'll, I'll tell my story, right? So, Please. I came on board um, the Seat Plus. Uh, I came on board doing, you know, doing this March of last year, so it's not too long ago, um, wearing my hat, you know, wearing this hat as an investor. Um, prior to that, uh, really uh, was with this company called um, Evernote. Right. Um, so, were you? So, if you, it says you ran the entire region for Evernote, right? So, I started the office and operations here in Singapore. Wow! Right back in uh, uh, 2012. It's actually quite an interesting story because uh, what happened was that when I was at my prior startup before Evernote, we were working on mobile payment solution, and I was introduced to uh, Troy Malone, my my you know my my former boss. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, and everyone was just, you know, it started to explode ac across the globe, doing really well. And I met him in Asia. In fact, I tried to sell him, um, you know, our solution, mobile payments. Um, that didn't work out. Uh, else it would turn out to be a really uh, different story. But uh, we ended up becoming really good friends and, you know, stay connected. So when I left my previous startup, I came on board uh, and he asked me, I was like, uh, Hey, do you want to help us out in Singapore, right? So, so that happened. I came on board and you know started the the operations here in Singapore in 2012, and it's been a really wonderful four years, you know, at at the company. Basically, launched the uh, product into the region, um, looking at market development in Southeast Asia and Australia, and uh, subsequently um, India, Korea, Taiwan. So. Uh, yeah, that was that was what it was. Right? So, what was it about? I mean, I'm an Evernote user, right? When, to be fair, when we're, yeah. when we're done you, doing this podcast, I'm going to go into Evernote, make some notes, organize things. That's where I do all of my thinking. Really, is in Evernote, and mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I've actually tried other note-taking programs, whether it was OneNote by Microsoft or some of the other ones. I just haven't. Mm -hmm. They just haven't really stuck with me, and I'm wondering why, from your perspective, mm -hmm. you think Evernote was so different. Like, what did Phil Libin do? from the beginning that made this so different? 
And I know it's well, I free think, at the beginning and distributed, but I just really want to know, like, from your perspective, yeah. when you were selling it and building it, why? Like, it was just yeah. so good. Well, I think I, the the interesting bit to think about here, to think about it here is that, uh, you know, on, on, on the surface, Evernote is a interest, really interesting product. You can understand it um, as simply as a note-taking software, but it's so much more than just a note-taking software, right? Absolutely. Because you know, if you look at it, there are tons and tons of alternatives that are available on on different platforms, on iOS, on Android, even pen and paper, right? Pen and paper is a great technology, by the way. Been around for 5,000 years. Doesn't run out of battery. So, ever. Ever, right? Uh, so, so I think it's it's that that you know, really helps you understand immediately what you could do with Evernote. But as you dig in deeper and spend more time within the product and you know the related eco- ecosystem that's integrated with the product, you, you realize that it's so much more than just note taking, right? It is a at least for me, it's a live management p- platform for myself, right? I call it the inbox for my life because any information that I have, whether it's structured data, um, notes, text, images, to highly unstructured uh, information like emails, web pages, what have you, it's all managed within Evernote, right? And it's it, it can be pretty powerful if you really spend time to to figure that out. So I think to me, that's, that's what it is, right? And that's also one of the reasons why I think it uh, uh, enables so many different use cases in so many different ways, right? You know, you're using it to manage your podcasting program. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm using it to manage projects, you know, at the firm. Um, I've, I've I've met people who manage entire businesses just using Evernote. This is just so fun to watch how people play with the tool, right? So, so you have multiple perspectives on this, though, right? So, you were you the founder of your the previous startup, the mobile payments business that you were talking about? Oh, right. So, like, uh, was I was an early founding team, so. I lost you there for a second. Say that again. You said you were part of the early founding team. Yes, I was part of the early founding team uh, here in Singapore. Again, okay. um, I was working on a product, then sus- subsequently sales and marketing. Well, and that didn't really matter because you were just five dudes in a room. Right? Sure, it doesn't. So. It doesn't really. At that point, it doesn't. Really, you're not in a department. You're just in a business. No. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. In my pajamas, no less. So, Correct. Uh, Oh, it could be less than that, actually. So, TMI, um, a little TMI there, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, five dudes, whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, but it was it was cool because I like, there was way back in like twenty ten to oh nine, right? And it's like the really, I would describe it as like the primordial era of uh, the tech and venture ecosystem here in Singapore. Right. I mean, it was a long and time ago, right? Yes, yeah, and by that extension, I would say it's you know to the entire Southeast Asia as well, right? So just five of us in 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 the college campus, and subsequently we uh, raised some funding. We did a Series A round with wow. uh, Singtel Innovate and uh, a couple other VCs, and uh, moved out to you know a proper office wearing pants this time, and you know grew the team at one point to about twenty people. So it's quite interesting because I want. If you remember back in 2009, 2010, that's the era when the iPhone 3G was introduced. I remember right? it well. Yeah, and I think what's more interesting is that, and people don't realize this, is the bigger innovation that came along with the iPhone 3G was the App Store. Yes. Right? That, yep. that, that really enabled the explosion of the you know, the mobile, the app economy, and that, that kick-started the whole revolution that you know, we're still seeing unfolding right now, right, 10 years on. Um, but it was, it was an interesting time, uh, and our product was a, um, um, an, an SDK, if you will, a software development kit, mm-hmm. to enable um, application and game developers uh, help, and to help them enable like uh, in-app payments within their content, right? So thank you for, because uh, the problem here is this, right? It's at that time, it's not clear which platforms would win. We know that you know the iPhones on track to dominating, but Android's emerging as well. Um, Nokia was still around, and uh, there was 
BlackBerry, there was still quite a force to be reckoned with. Sure, there was no way to know right. what was going to happen. There was no way to know who was going to win. There's no way to no. know. And our thesis here was that as an as, as an app developer, uh, you you spend most of your time creating content, but the but the and the value doesn't doesn't lie in you know uh, creating what I call the plumbing work, right? To connect to these other app stores. Um, if you're cre- if you're if you're Angry Birds, you, you probably have like fifty versions of Angry Birds on on the thirty versions of uh, Android app stores in China, uh, you know, in the different telco stores, and that's just Android, right? And we're not we're not even talking about BlackBerry and and uh, Windows Phone yet, right? right? You know, so our thesis here is that could we create a solution to help you enable uh, payments and distribution to all these stores? Um, so that's what we did, you know. In fact, uh, I think we were the first product in the world, in fact, um, to enable payments for the Windows Phone, you know, within the Microsoft Garden. Right. Um, and but that didn't matter at all. I was going to say in the end, <laughs> good for you guys, but it didn't really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you didn't know. It didn't matter at all. Yeah, you you um, didn't know, right? You had to do it, and it was good at the no, time. It was. We had to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, what's funny to know is that at, even at, at its peak, I don't think uh, Windows Phone was ever above 7% global market share. Maybe, right? Maybe. May, and that's a really questionable maybe, right? Right, that's a maybe. Um, um, yeah, and one thing we did not anticipate was how quickly the different uh, platforms consolidated. Right. And how quickly, you know... Nokia just faded fade into irrelevance. BlackBerry died a horrible death, and Windows Phone didn't matter at all. And you know, Android was just moving on and getting better every day, and iPhone was dominating, right? So really quickly, our value proposition went away, and you know, we couldn't find a way to to scale the company. And uh, long story short, I like to tell people that it became a very good learning experience. <laughs> but it was though, right? You you yeah. laugh about it, right? Maybe because you were too close to it. But for me, the reason why I wanted to hear about it was because I think the things that you learned, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the things that you learned by building that or trying to build that and maybe watch the market move away from you, mm-hmm. right? And make decisions about where's the right place to put our resources and how much money right. do we spend on all those types of questions. Now you have to look at from the other side. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I think like one thing that I could, one thing that I really appreciate, you know, drawing from my experience in those days is it's it's just a, a gift that keeps giving. You know what I mean? Sure. A lot of times, like uh, most of the time, in fact, when you're deep in the weeds, when you're in the trenches, when bullets are flying around, you there's no time for you to internalize what's going on. Correct. Right? But it's, as you move on with your career, with your life, as you see more things, you meet more people, you get more points of references, and that helps you learn and new perspectives from you know the same experience, right? If you, so I think like that's a definitely a really helpful um, thing that I did, you know, in that in, in in that it really helped me now that I'm wearing my uh, venture hat to empathize and really help founders to to contextualize their experiences, right? Right. And that's a great word, actually. I like to use it a lot. Mm-hmm. When you contextualize that experience, it, it means you yeah, really absolutely. understand yep. it really well. And even mm-hmm. for the entrepreneurs that are either pitching to you or that become one of your investee companies, because yep. they are deep in the weeds, mm-hmm. they sometimes miss the bigger picture. Not Again, not because they're not trying and not because they're stupid at any level. It's more just because yep. they're, they're nose to the grindstone trying to get stuff done. Yep. And as a proper investor, it seems to me that if you invest yep. in an optimal, an optimal amount of companies, yep. you can sort of take a 35,000 foot view of all of them and say, I understand what mm-hmm. you're doing, but look, the market's changing or the market you're in mm-hmm. is, is really it. Don't mm-hmm. look outside and just dedicate all, like all of these pieces of advice you can give, I think, come out of the fact that you had that experience. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, this, and this is actually this is actually a really interesting topic to talk about. Tell me, you no. Know, on one hand, you know, many a times people would ask, "Are you know, do you necessarily need to have operating experiences to be a good VC?" You no, know, or no, right, or not, right? Because we have seen really good examples from two ends of the spectrum. 
Um, my personal take on this is that it really does help me uh, empathize better with founders. Um, you know, but that doesn't really m- make me a great investor by definition. I right? agree. You know, I, I, there's still so much to learn. I'm, we're just day one on our journey right now. So, uh, even though yes, you no, know, we do, do we, there, there is, there, there are some prior experiences that we could draw from, but there, there's just so much more to learn, right? Right. I mean, so the point that I try to make across the spectrum is, if you've operated in a business, whether you've succeeded or failed, right? The the concept that you really should get out of it is, I, there are a lot of things that I know. But the spectrum of things that I don't know is much, much wider. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and what that means is that you can bring your experience as an operator or even as an investor into any particular startup or any particular company, and you can use mm-hmm. it as a frame of reference for your advice or mentoring to them. Mm-hmm. But the best investors are the people that know they don't know everything, and they stop and think mm-hmm. and say, hmm, based on my experience, I've learned this, but... There's 90% of the world I don't understand. Let me try to figure that out as well. While they're running the race, I'm going to kind of yep. drive the van next to them and figure out that they don't need water, yep. they need electrolytes or whatever it is so I can help them out. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And I think, that's the, I think those yeah. are the best mm-hmm. investors, actually. Operating experience Absolutely. or not. Yeah. Well, it's so tough to, it's so tough to discern, right? Because I Correct. think like on the, my view of the world is this, right? Broadly speaking, there are two skills that you learn when you're investing, right? There are the core operating skills that you you bring along with you from your past lives, call it that, right? Um, have you run, for example, have you built a sales organization, right? Have you have you done a product launch, right? And these are some of the things that you could help translate for startups right. if they're in that particular situation right now. But a harder and longer, you know, longer term skill that I think it's really difficult to master, it's dealing with people right <laughs> how do you how do you help like how do you help coach founders and being better founders and leaders how do you help co- you know uh help them deal with the myriad of people problems i look i like to call it that right within the organization how do you manage your board right and that's the ongoing art that you continue to learn um and for those skills it doesn't matter if you have prior operating experience or not it's it's a work in progress constantly. Right. So do you want to get, can you give me a couple of examples? I'm really curious about this and I, I agree with you actually. The the skills that are around um, launching a sales organization and managing that are relatively well known. They change from company to company but, right. but the overall concepts are relatively well known. Yep. Okay. And they're, rel- again, relatively. I like to use that word because nothing is absolutely simple or hard, right? Sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But, People skills are really difficult to teach and understand because you bring the sum total sort of of your life's psychological journey into every relationship. Yep. So how do you coach that? And then I want to really want to understand what you think makes up a good board of directors because to me that's something so specific that people can understand and I'm really curious actually. Right, and again, the disclaimer here is that I'm still so new at it. Sure, 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 but you, no, no, no. <laughs> so, but I, look, I agree, but the idea is, yeah. again, you yeah. have an opinion that you've formed over, you know, a few years of experience, and I'm just curious what you think. It's, yeah. um, you know, there's no test at the end of this, right? Right, right, But right, the idea absolutely. is, I want to understand what other people think. It helps me shape what I think. Right, right. In fact, um, I think one really good, uh, what, well, another podcast I was listening to. Um, Tell me. I think it was Kara Shrisher's podcast. She was interviewing, um, I forgot the name of the two gentlemen, but they basically they had a book called um, Built to Great. Um, it's basically a dissection around the four archetypes of you know, founder psyche, right? Um, and they are, generally speaking, I'm breaking it down here, the driver, right? And one prime example of a driver type will be Steve Jobs, Travis Kanick, Right. Um, there's the captain, right? Captains captains like to build teams, right? Um, that's the primary driver and motivation of a captain type uh founder and entrepreneur. Um there's also the um called the evangelist, right? The people who are really mission driven, mission driven founders. And last but not least, I think it's uh for a for a label now, but basically it's someone that's um really driven by uh, the sense of I want to 
get things organized, right? These are system builders. Right, system. Right? So the book, so, just just to be clear, the book you're talking about is Built for Growth, right? And this is the book that was written by Chris Keen and John Danner. That's right. right? That's and they right. were interviewed by yeah. Kara Swisher on Recode Decode, which I find to be exactly. very informative, actually. But I wanted to make sure that we yep. reference it properly because you brought up a really good source, actually, of information. And, and, and sorry, keep going with these four types because I, I listened to that as well and I thought it was fascinating, actually. It was super fascinating because uh, it helped me put a label on a lot of the different personalities that you come across during your investing career. Right. And that also also helps inform how you would respond to certain person personalities as well. Right. 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 Um, generally speaking, you know, I, I, I can't, my view of the world is that I don't think there's a right type of personality to be a great founder. Agreed completely. Uh, completely. The, the key here is really to build a great team right that's supporting that founder around him or her um and by team by extension of that team that also includes the board as well right okay um the, the, that, that's that's how i look at you know the entire organization in you know holistically speaking um so as it comes to boards i think uh you know at, at our stage of investment at the seed stage we we don't have big boards. Boards are not necessarily super complex. Um, three people, five people. What do you think? Three, three people. It's it's more than enough most of the time. Two founders and one external investor. Right. Um, five people. It's complex most of the time. It starts getting um, really complex at this stage, right? To have five people and even just to find five people is hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like one thing that founders would tend to get sucked into is half the time you're running the company. Yeah, the other half of the time you're managing your board. Right, right, so, right. right, right. And, again, it's more people introduced into the mix, right? That are right, hard again, to manage. Pe- again, people problems, right? And you kind of want to, you know, optimize for not having to deal with that yet. As uh, delay it as far out as you can. Um, but that said, I do think that if you're conscious and smart about building your board, there, there, there are immense value that you could derive from just having a panel to go to whenever you. You want to check in on, uh, you know, certain questions, um, or having an advice advisory sound, or you know, or, or you know, in, within the room. I think that's super helpful. One thing that I think founders don't do enough here in Asia is, you know, beyond just having like an informal board, right, and really getting good at reaching out and maintaining relationships with mentors right so this is um, that was going to be my next question actually if you don't mind yeah me, if you don't sure. mind me interrupting and that is so i like I, I i've said this before right but i mentor a lot of companies i've invested in a bunch of companies i don't necessarily always ask to sit on the board of directors but what i do yes. like to do is sit on an advisory board and sometimes i like to manage the advisory board because i think it's important to have people that are deeply interested in your company, but they don't get to necessarily vote on things so that when they give you advice, it's completely unbiased. Yes, absolutely. And we kind of we kind of talk about this um, a little bit prior to, you know, or just earlier, right? Because sometimes when you're so involved and deep in the trenches, Correct. You really, it would be really helpful for you to have some, uh, you know, voice that's unbiased, that's neutral, that's looking at things from, from a you know, less emotional perspective, and that's right. always always helpful. Right. right? So now, but one thing I think that again, this is where I think uh, founders, especially here in Asia, has uh, a lot more to learn. It's how do you engage, uh, you know, your network, you know, mentors, and now th- this doesn't necessarily have to be a formal board, right? As right. you as you pointed out. Right. But really getting good at, you know, maintaining maintaining that relationship, engaging with mentors and, you know, uh uh just build that personal support network. So And how do you find those people? In other words, if you're you're a company founder, you don't want to spend a lot of time going out necessarily and trying to yeah. find those people. Do you help yeah. them do that as well? Yeah, we do. I mean I see it as my personal mission, if you will, to really help uh if I can, if if there are some, I mean, one one way to think think about this is that if there are certain areas where I don't feel like uh, I have deep enough experiences to help the founder, I you know my value add here then is how do I help connect the founder to, you know, someone that they would trust, right? 
um, and to help provide perspectives and experiences to advise the founder. Um, it's definitely one of the things that you know uh, we do as investors to try to help that, to to try to help and add value. Um, it's funny because I I think a lot of times when people ask me a question like oh so how do you look for a mentor. The, the funny thing is that most people that I perceive as mentors, I, they don't know that, they don't know that they are mentors to me. Right, exactly. You, you don't, you don't sit down and sell, tell them, thank you, Lisa. I'm really happy you're mentoring me. That right. conversation and, rarely happens. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So I think a lot of times it's just like, you know, you want to be a person, right? You want to be a person. You want to form genuine, authentic relationships with people that you respect. Correct. And that goes both ways, right? And, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily be, mean that you have to formalize a mentor-mentee relationship. Um, but, you know, that does mean that you are, you, you need to build uh, you need to get great at building relationships, right? And frankly, I think uh, that's that's a hallmark of a great entrepreneur, right? You need to be able to engage uh, your stakeholders with within your industry, within your business, and form the form form those relationships. Because the number one, the, the, I think, the core skill a founder should have is to to be able to sell and communicate your idea, and maintain and you know form great relationships, right? Because that's what build great enterprises. Right, I mean, because in the end, the people that are buying your products are other people. The people that are using your products are actually other people. And even if it's machine mm-hmm. learning, in the end, all mm-hmm. that data is going to mm-hmm. get sold to a human or somebody who needs to be able to make decisions to use it. And if you don't have mm-hmm. great relationships or can't build great relationships with people, they'll just go to somebody else. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's such a human business, right? I think you know, there's a lot of talk around, like, you know, how do you – the 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 coming of the of AI, how you know how do you retrain and reskill? Will we become dis- will we be disrupted and become obsolete? I think to to some degree, yes. You know, we we kind of need to rethink like how business is done, whether it's venture or startups or what have you. But at the end of the day, you know, it's also such a human driven thing, right? You know, you 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 really have to be able to understand and empathize with another human being. You know, form those connections, um, and that's something that you can't just automate away. I don't think. Right. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to not just founders and entrepreneurs, but also to end users about what the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to be on their businesses. And I have my own mm-hmm. view on how that's going to look. I'm curious what you think that that's going to look like in five, ten years. I mean, it's hard to put a time frame on it, right? Because I think it's already happening to a certain extent. It is, yeah. But I can make a, I can make equivalencies to what happened in the um, trading markets. So I think I have an idea, but I'm curious what you think. How do you think that's going to affect enterprises and humans that work inside them when artificial intelligence really becomes prevalent or, or um, ubiquitous? Right. So here's my view, right? I think one one way I'll, one example that I really, really like is when this electronic spreadsheet was invented, right? right. If you... If, if you read back to news clippings around, you know, I think it was like what the sixties, seventies, the seventies, right? Uh, the, all this talk around like, oh, you know, accountants will lose their jobs on mass, will become, will be replaced by by machines, but that didn't really happen. If, if you really think about it, each accountant became became more efficient, right? Correct. Uh, as a result of that. Correct. No, ultimately, I don't think. And this one, this one, one way we thought about it at, at, at Evernote, actually, when we when we talk about AI, you know, we don't necessarily see that as artificial in, uh, intelligence. We saw that as augmented intelligence. Yeah, right? human so, enhancement really is the way I like to call it. But yeah, right, fair enough. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you know, at, at its core, AI is just you know machine learning. These are these are tools. These are technology that could help you do your job better. Um, it's it's your relationship with the two that you probably need to uh, uh, rejig a little bit, but ultimately, you know, technology is built to serve you, right? right. As, as as a human as a human being, right? Um, so that's 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 philosophically that's the way I think about it. I don't necessarily think that. Well, in the short term, I do think that there will be some short term pains, right? People need to really understand and evolve their relationship with. Um, these tools and services that are getting smarter and smarter. Right. Um, but over the long run, I don't see that as you know a, a, 
necessary the replacing function. So do you see, comp- I really want to start talking a little bit about investing and maybe investment philosophies or investment yeah, theses. Yeah. Oh, but to be fair, we can do that an, at another time because both of these conversations actually really interest me. Um, but you've just sort of segued really nicely into it, right? So I just, you know, this whole concept of augmented intelligence, which I think is, right. a, is a great term, um, instead of really artificial intelligence, I mean, what is artificial and what isn't really? But I agree with mm-hmm. this whole concept of it's there to help humans, not necessarily to get in their way and take their lives away, right? Right. But now you're sitting there with an investor's hat, and you must get pre- presented a lot of stuff where people like to use buzzwords, oh, this has AI built oh, into it, or God. machine learning, yep. and you're like, oh my yes. God, it's just a toaster for God's sakes kind of thing. Yes, 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 <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> you know, it, it's it, like buzzword it, bingo every day at the office. It must be horrible, but, yep. but how do you determine... And, and it's a hard question, right? But how do you try it to deter- how do you, how do you yeah. try to determine whether something is actually augmenting the intelligence of somebody or not, and whether that technology is really going to be useful, or if someone's just throwing buzzwords at you? Yeah, you know, frankly, I don't really respond to to those bu- buzzwords. Good, because neither do I. But you still do. But you still do want to make sure that somebody who's building do, a product wanna... is having that in, as part of it, right? Yeah, you still do. You kind of want to understand, like, w- you know, what are smoke and mirrors and what's real, right? So, right. Um, but no, and there's a reason why there's, there is a reason why I don't respond to that because, frankly, I think if you look at if you look at a, a, a startup, right? If you look at a startup from a first principles perspective, ultimately it's about creating something of value to an you know to an audience, right? With an audience in mind. And most of the time, if not all of the time, say audience is your customer, right? Right. Um, it doesn't matter what technology that's being used to to, to create, create that, that value. That. Right. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, it has to it has to be useful and valuable to a certain constituency, right? Um, so I care a lot more about that, right? Are you? Uh, no. Do you? Are you absolutely sure that you're solving a problem that's worth solving? Right, and it, is it a product that should exist because of you know how huge that problem is? And do you understand your customers uh, deeply? Do you care about your customers deeply? Right, that's that's all. That's that's something that I index. They rather index more heavily on, rather than you know what cool new shiny you know framework or APIs or like technologies that you're using. Right. Fair enough. But then, what's the what's the thesis, right? So you're in a mm-hmm. seed, you're in a seed stage fund. You've got a great mm-hmm. partner, but you've also got great mm-hmm. external partners as well, right? Which mm-hmm. Michael mentioned mm-hmm. a little bit when we spoke last week, the week right. before. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how do you like? You wake up every day and you think about this new world and all the new technology that's getting created. You have mm-hmm. your own interests, and yet some of those interests may not yes, dovetail yeah. with yes. the best product. So how do you? How do yes. you think about investing, just from the beginning to end? How do, and how do you source things right. to invest uh-huh. in? How does that whole process work for you? And it's different for everybody, right? It is different for everybody. And I think Micah mentioned briefly around the different themes that we care about. Okay. Um, so as a yeah, as a firm, I think uh, we have there are certain theses that as a firm we we pay more attention to, we care about. Um, you know that revolves around five core teams: right. marketplaces, automation. I wouldn't go into I wouldn't go deep into weeds into all of them. No, no, no. Um, but like, but one thing, one great point that you mentioned here is that you know, uh, each of us we do have different interests, right? right. And I would add to that different um, professional background, Correct. And experiences, you no, know, uh, to leverage as well. And to that end, you know, me personally, I, I do tend to pay more attention to things, you know, things that are related to fintech because of my background, um, and also you know productivity SaaS, enterprise SaaS, cloud services. Um, those are my more natural inclinations, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, I think uh, at the C stage, it's it's pretty diff- difficult to say. You no, know, I would only focus on. Right. And you no know, cloud productivity in Southeast Asia. Like, right? you know, you pro- <laughs> that probably you probably wouldn't have too much to do in, in that regard, right? So I think for me personally, at least I I I allow I budget for some uh what I call serendipity time. Okay. To really you know to really learn and expand you know my horizons uh 
uh, and really understanding you know what's what's interesting and what's developing right in the region. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a really great point, and this is this is something I ask about all the time, right? Is yeah. you say, and I'm just saying, you as the general you. Let's say you say, mm-hmm. like, I'm focused mm-hmm. more on fintech, productivity, mm-hmm. and SaaS. Mm-hmm. You know, in the firm itself, you mentioned two things: marketplaces and automation. But it doesn't mean, I think, if you have an open mind as an investor, that if somebody comes to you with an idea that's so compelling, that maybe falls outside of your core competency, you wouldn't at least sit down and listen to it. If for nothing else, you just learn something. Is that a fair characterization? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one thing that uh, Amit from Jungle Venture kind of characterizes really well, well, right? And I'm paraphrasing here. Please. Great investors are great at pattern recognition, right. but, um, but, but, and there's a huge but here. Um, that's also, you know, that could also be your greatest downfall. Sure, there's but, danger in that as well, right? Exactly. So, like, once you build a certain, uh, you know, way of recognizing patterns over time, it's so hard to rejigger that. And it's, it, it has to be a really conscious process, you know, to, to continuously to question first principles, underlying assumptions, have they shifted? Have they changed? Is the time right is this time right for technology X? And and that has to be a really disciplined and conscious effort, right, I think. Right. So and I think the the sort of cliched example of that is if we continue to reference the fact that Webvan you know, raised yeah, a billion that, dollars, actually. but it, but yeah, but, it's it, but it's the perfect example. Yeah. Not because there was it anything the wrong with it, yeah. but mm-hmm. but if we can, if we continue to reference the fact that Webvan failed even with a billion dollars of investment, so that food delivery right. or just yeah. on-time delivery is never going to work. Yeah, you know, then we wouldn't be where we were today with Happy Fresh or Redmart or any of these other companies that have built really um, yeah. finely yeah. tuned logistics businesses. Because back then, the technology that was available to them just wasn't um, <laughs> appropriate for the business that they wanted yes. to do. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's an example that's particularly close to heart because my wife worked at Redmart. <laughs> right. Uh, right. She, yeah, she was the uh, one of the first marketing hires at Redmart, and now she's with Amazon uh, in Singapore. <laughs> right. So, okay, fair you know, enough. That's, <laughs> that's a really, really interesting example you know, that's particularly close to heart, right? Because like, through, through, through her lens, you know, I really saw that some of these big fundamental pieces are, are suddenly true, right? Not right. necessarily true 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but they are true now, right? And that, that has really what enabled the, 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 the entire model to work, right? right. Well, well, and, but you know, that's, that's not, it's not saying that you know, we will see, see this being a successful venture yet. You know, I mean, I don't think Ray Mars out of the woods yet, but... Um, you can see it as a path towards that right, right, right. now. So. Look, I have my own opinion about Redmart as a business sure. yeah. as well, but we don't need to get mm-hmm. into that. But I wanted to sort of touch on one other thing that you said and, and then just continue to talk about the way you yep. view the investment landscape because I think there are some mm-hmm. interesting things happening uh, yes. outside of individual companies and maybe more macro. But one of my favorite investors when I was in the public markets once said to me, his opinion, right? His opinion was this, mm-hmm. that the greatest investors are able to anticipate mm-hmm. the anticipations of others. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, again, and it's like what you said. It's not always true that pattern rec- that merely recognizing a pattern means that that pattern is going to continue. But the ability to see the pattern is where the power is. You may not yep. like it. Yeah. Right, you may see a pattern Absolutely. where everybody's investing in the wrong company. That's also yep. pattern recognition. But the fact that you're thinking about it, I think, is really important. Absolutely, and actually, I think really that's that's one of the more. If you ask me, I think that's one of the, and this might be controversial. I think that's actually the one of the easiest things to do when you're starting out as a new investor. Is what? Uh, uh, to recognize patterns, right? Recognize. Right. Uh, right. Not saying that that's. Uh, Easy is incredibly difficult. It's just, to me, one of the lowest hanging fruits that you could immediately start working on. I think at, at the very minimum, what's harder than that is really going zooming down to a particular company, a particular deal, a particular team, and how do you put all those bits and pieces together to make sure that it's a successful investment, you know, rather than rather than not, right? Now, I take an example. For for example, it's it's a foregone conclusion that machine learning is going to change the world. I think, right? But how do you, within this context, you know, look 
for a team with the relevant background, with the right founder dynamics, and your ability to help and add value through the entire journey of the company. Right. Because this is actual, this is real business building we're talking about here, right? And I think that's probably the harder part than really understanding and making a bet on a trend or a, or, or, or a pattern, right? If, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, like you said, it's a foregone conclusion that machine learning is going to tr- change the way businesses interact with other businesses, but also with individuals. Full stop. That's a given. Right. But just because I come to you as a company and say, we're going to use machine learning to do X, whatever X is, I may not have any of the qualifications. I may not even have the team dynamics internally, whether it's the CEO, the CTO, the CMO, or the head of sales, to understand that. Yes. Yeah. It's so, it's so, incredibly tough. So what? Right? Yep. Exactly. It's incredibly tough, right? If you look at uh, any of the grades of the past few decades, Google, Facebook, right? Uh, hopefully Airbnb and Uber right now. Right. right. There's, there's just there's no, no such thing as too big to fail. No and way. I mean, any, right. And any point your the the your path to greatness is fraught with you know pitfalls and potholes, right? <laughs> and there's so many different reasons that you could have died. You know. Yeah. I mean, look, it happened in the retail space for years in the United States. If I had told you in the in the mid '80s that Kmart was going to go away, you would have laughed at me. But they'd already beaten. Um, Sears, and they'd already beaten some of the other sort of mid-level retailers. And if I told you that Walmart, which was sort of like a cheap knockoff crappy store started in Arkansas, was going to like take over the retail space in the United States, you would have laughed at me again. But you're right. Your today's success is no guarantee of tomorrow's success. And that's true, as you said, even for a company like Uber. And this is why... Jeff Bezos, who's taken so much flack over the years for not generating a profit... Yeah, he's generated tons of profit, but he's decided to take that profit and build it into a much bigger machine. Oh yeah, because absolutely. he is scared mm-hmm. every day. Absolutely, yeah. of becoming irrelevant, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd rather look at it as you no, know, in, in its totality, investing and business building, rather than you no, know, simply you no, know, I'm making a bet, right? Of course, it's an intelligent bet, but you you want to be part of, uh, and I think, frankly, that's where the our inv- investment philosophy, you know, is a derivation of that, right? We, we want to be really operational involved VCs. We were operators from before. We think we know a thing or, or two about building products and businesses. Right. Um, of course, you know, we we're investing. There are trends that we bet on, but more important than that, we are building businesses here, right? So. Right. I mean, I wanted to actually move from that conversation to macro, but you brought up a, mm-hmm. a micro question for me, if you don't mind me asking. Sure. Yeah. Right. So you did comment on the team, the management team and the founding team. And I do think it's a real differentiating factor. Two teams come to you with the same idea and maybe even the same skill level. Mm-hmm. How do you determine? What are you thinking about? What are you trying to find out when you're talking to those teams and how, and again, every situation is different. I know that, but just in general. Yeah. How do you try yep. to decide, like, how do you make a decision or, or which one to choose? It's hard. It's incredibly difficult, right? Um, I think for one, really, I think I'll look at, I look at it, I tend to look at it on uh, two levels. Okay. Uh, first of which, really, it's on, on the team itself. Um, do they care enough about the customer, right? Do they have, because of that, are they obsessed with the customer? Do they have unique insights? that's a derivation of, from that obsession, right? Um, that I care more because it shows learning behavior, it shows um, um, your passion about a certain industry or product. Right. Um, I think what's what's more nuanced than that is really, uh, which is the, the second level here, your potential working relationship with the with their founders. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's I really think, important again, though, right? It's super important because I again we talk about boards, we talk about you know the advisory relationship. Um, I think a lot of a lot of times, right? If you think about it, to build a successful business is already so tough. Right. You know, you you will want to work with people that you 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 can work with. You no, know, you you will want to work with people that are capable. Um, 
and you know, and it's it's for the long haul, right? So if if the value, if your principles are unaligned, if the if your values are unaligned, if that's not a constructive working relationship, it's like it it will be pretty pretty tough. Right. I mean, I think if you have a combative and combative may be too strong a word, but I think if you're right. in the situation where you're trying to make an investment decision and you're there's too much tension or too combative relationship, yep. that's never going to get better. Yep. Well, again, it's not saying that uh, you shouldn't challenge each other. Of course, I actually the, think I said that's a positive yeah. thing. No, no, yeah. challenging each other is fine. And I chose the word combative actually um, on purpose. Right. In other yeah. words, I'm just fighting against you. Right. I'm not fighting with you. Two completely right. different things, right? Absolutely, right, right. I think, and I, and I think all of that goes back fundamentally to: can are you able to build a relationship that's based on trust? Because once the foundation of having a trusting relationship is there, you could have a a uh, you know there will be challenging times, there will be trying times, you right. would have difficult periods, but as long as the core, you have a trusting relationship. You can move past those, right? Um, but again, right? That's it's so much of an art. It's a people's business. It's just so much to to watch and learn still. So, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the key things that I'm getting out of this whole conversation is that one of the things you focus on quite a bit is those people skills and the leadership skills of the teams. So very important. Yeah. But also, you used a word which I really like: genuine, right? Building a genuine relationship with people, and that I think cuts across the entire spectrum of people with whom a, a, um, a founder and a stakeholder is going to have to deal with, right? So it's not just yep. not just your team members, not just your employees, not just your investors, and not just yep. your clients. It's all of them. Right. Because right. Unless, unless those relationships are genuine, they're going to break down. And as soon as they start to break down, like you said, the... The um, even your most successful companies, their path to that success and their path during that success is just fraught with danger. And the only thing that's going to help you, yeah, guaranteed to help you, is those genuine relationships that you had. If people want you to succeed, your chances of success are higher. They're not guaranteed, but they're just so much yes, higher. So much higher. And and here's another perspective, right? If you really think about it, the venture business is one of the very few business that rewards. Play, you know, from a in a game theory perspective, players being nice in the long term. Absolutely. Have you done research? I've done a ton of research on this, actually. Oh, really? Okay. So I mean, like, I mean, what my perspective here is that it's an iterative game, right? It's an iterative game, which means that there's no there's no like and num limited number of turns to the game, which really means that you know the game rewards people being nice, right, in the in the ecosystem. Not necessarily nice, nice to a fault, but you want to be you want to be a good player, a good actor in the ecosystem in the long run, because your reputation is everything. Right. Founders talk to each other. Right. You know, you want to be you you want to be a constructive, you no know, contributor to the ecosystem. Right. right? And I was because I was that. my natural inclination was to say it cuts both ways, right? And that was me just of course, yeah. that, but that just that's just me bifurcating the community into investors and founders. But I think it actually cuts every way is probably the better way to say it because, yeah, you know, it's just it it just goes around and around, right? And you're right. If you're a great founder, and you have potential investors that were just mean. Right. I, I always say, like, you don't have to be mean to be smart. Yep. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. No, you say, you, of, you say, of course, yeah. but there are plenty of people who feel like their innate intelligence um, gives them the right to be dismissive and mean. And I feel like, hmm, we're not so right, stupid yeah. over here not, either. And no, I don't think you consider yeah. yourself dumb, but you're nice. And you said, you, what you said actually was really interesting. You said, yeah. I don't mean nice to a fault. And that implies right. weakness. But I actually think that... People that are mean are genuinely scared. <laughs> <laughs> Insecure. <laughs> Insecure. Yeah. And I think the nicer you are, the more secure you are. Like, I dare you really to try to out-execute me, right? Because again, the ideas are a dime a dozen. We're going to come full circle to what makes a great investment, right? But the ideas right. are a dime a dozen. Can you out-execute me? And can you get partners yeah. to execute with you Yeah. to help you? Yeah. And that gets back to your genuine relationships and your people skills, I think. Right. So here's another perspective, and I think uh, you can't see that really apparent, being really apparent here in the venture industry in Asia right now because it's still so young. Okay. But if you look at Silicon Valley, right, uh, great entrepreneurs they come back again, yes, and again, yes, and again, right. Yep. And you know, they, 
throughout the entire career, there might be two or three, four or five successful ventures. And you can almost say that you know, instead of looking at investing in a certain company, you can you you are actually investing in the career of a successful founder. You are right. So that you know, to me, I think that's super important, right? Because if that's the case, you want to invest in the career of a of a great founder. Uh, they might fail the first time around, even the second time around, but the third time, the fourth time, if they do come back, you know that you'll be successful, right? Yeah, I mean, look, Elon Musk is the perfect example of this, but all of these Absolutely. people that have started, um, you know that once they figure out how to succeed, they just need to mm-hmm. find the right platform for their next level of success if they want to. You know for sure that sure. if yeah. Bezos said, I'm leaving Amazon, I'm going to go start something else, raising investment capital would be yeah. stupid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he's a bad example, frankly, because he's never leaving. But the idea that... (laughs) (laughs) Nor does he need to fundraise. (laughs) Well, fair enough. But you understand the point. And the point is that, as you mentioned, right, and as you brought up really nicely, is that you're really investing in that team of people or in those people who are just going to continuously succeed. Yes. Yeah. And I find that especially crucial to start doing that now because... Um, you know, trying to go back to, from a more macro perspective, right? The venture, the venture community and ecosystem in in Asia is still rather young. Very, very you know, young. It's nascent. You right? tend to, it is nascent, right? And you know, especially so in 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 the VC in, uh, industry. Correct. You 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 start seeing like second time entrepreneurs are coming back, but you also I I bet you will also start seeing like you know uh, the the digital market. T- people from Lazada, for instance, right, starting companies, or right. like uh, the first product manager from, um, let's say, 99.co, right, right starting right. companies, right? So I think that will happen really relatively quickly. Um, you know, we be- that's that's why I think it's especially important to, to, to do that now, right? Yeah, I agree. And look, I think this is, if you don't mind, I wanted to get into a longer conversation actually about macro, but that is much sure, more yeah. than, no, but it's more than like a five minute conversation and I don't want to restrict it. So what I will say is this, why don't we end Part now? Two? Yeah, why don't C4? we end now and and let's think about how to talk about the next time we discuss, you know, macro investing trends and not just trends, but just your view on macro and how yeah, that impacts yeah. what you yeah. do. because. A lot of things changing right now at the macro level, right? The micro level, yes. we talked a little bit about, right? Company sectors, yeah. but the micro, the macro level, I think, is really interesting. But yeah. if we start that now, we could talk for another hour, and we've already done that a little bit. So I'd like to just thank you, really. I mean, what what a great team. So I'm, you thank know, I'm, you. no, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I interview a ton of people. You can see it, and it's just great to listen to teammates that sort of. You know, have the same sort of core values and the core way to think, and yet have different strengths, right? Which means you guys can help yep. support each other. You have different yep. backgrounds slightly, which means you can actually have a, like you said, you can challenge each other and have a proper discussion. It, it, yep. I've really come away from the phone call with you and with Michael thinking these guys are going to succeed, right? You're going to oh, have some you. failures yeah. in your portfolio, but you guys are going to succeed over time. And it's too kind for you to say that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to blow smoke up anybody's <laughs> ass, if you don't mind me saying, at yeah. any level, because it's yeah. not necessary. But And I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it. But that's really the way I felt. And that's I just sure. say what I think, right? right. Um, but I really want to thank you um, for your time. And I want you to promise that you're going to come back. Oh, of course. I uh, appreciate that thought and uh, invitation, for sure. Okay, let's do that. So thank you again yep. very much for your time. Tiang Lian yep. Fu, Seed Plus. I got it right this time. Um, <laughs> yep. And I'll never get it wrong again because I'm humiliated when I make mistakes, particularly when I do it publicly. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the conversation. Cheers. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.